One of the residents recently asked me about giving children statin drugs, and uh, I'd heard about this in the literature, and I wanted to review it further because the thought of giving a child a statin for his whole life uh, concerns me in regards to the potential for risk. So I just wanted to review the guidelines a little bit uh, closer here with you, and these are when it is recommended that we order a fasting lipid panel on a child ages 2 to 10. So if you have a child who has a family history of dyslipidemia or premature heart disease and a relative less than 55 years of age, or they have the classic risk factors of obesity, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, kind of a sad state of our culture that we even have these risk factors for our children, but unfortunately they are becoming more prevalent. Or if you have a child who has had an organ transplant, has lupus nephrotic syndrome, or is on protease inhibitor therapy, they should be screened for dyslipidemia. Now those who it is recommended that uh, therapy be started with a statin, a fibric, uh, or nicotinic acid are those children uh, who have familial hyperlipidemia with an LDL greater than 500. These are children less than 10. Obviously, a statin would probably significantly benefit their long-term health, and referral to cardiology is indicated. But those children less than 10 who have an LDL greater than 130, there's really no guidelines at this time on when we should initiate therapy, uh, specifically with pharmaceuticals, and that uh, should probably be related to their individual risk factors. For those kids older than 10 with an LDL greater than 190 uh, who have no risk factors, the recommendation is that we treat them with drugs to reduce their LDL less than 160. If they have an LDL greater than 160 and two or more risk factors, we should. Uh, it is recommended that we treat them with drugs to lower their LDL to less than 130. And if their LDL is greater than 130 and they have multiple risks, uh, the recommendation is that we reduce their LDL to less than 110. Now, the idea of screening uh, for dyslipidemia at an early age is a good one. We want to try and reduce their risk factors as much as possible to reduce plaque development in their coronary arteries. But the methods are concerning, particularly when we're talking about giving a drug that blocks an enzyme at such a volatile age uh, before puberty. We, we've learned from using other drugs that uh, drugs can be very beneficial, such as proton pump inhibitors and healing ulcers by blocking the acid pump. But we also are learning of the long-term consequences of these drugs in inhibiting certain nutrient absorptions, such as iron and B12 and calcium, or tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, where we uh, find them to be quite beneficial in treating autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease, but we also have potential long-term risk of opportunistic infection and even malignancy. Now, if we're suggesting giving an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor to a child uh, throughout his life, we need to ensure that we have good evidence for safety. And we know that when we block HMG-CoA reductase. We also reduce coenzyme Q10. I'm, I'm sorry for showing you the Krebs cycle. A little vomit came up in the back of my throat when I first uh, pulled this out of my textbook, but I wanted to remind myself of how HMG-CoA reductase works. And since it does block coenzyme Q10, which is needed for ATP production within the mitochondria, it makes sense of why these drugs can cause myositis and myopathy not to mention the potential for hepatotoxicity. But if we also look at the enzymatic cascade of uh, what HMG-CoA reductase is a part of, we can see that uh, it is an important cascade for the production of many important uh, uh, chemicals, including cholesterol, and cholesterol is the main building block of steroids. And if we're talking about giving these drugs to kids who are pre-pubertal, uh, we uh, do not know of the potential risks or influences that these drugs may have on their uh, pubertal development, uh, particularly uh, when we use them prior to this important transition in their lives. As you can see here also, the uh, bisphosphonates are also involved in this cascade, and this may uh, suggest why statins seem to be uh, beneficial in bone strength in that they uh, inhibit uh, this cascade that can increase the risk of osteoporosis. But the concern here is that bisphosphonates also uh, significantly increase the risk of esophageal cancer. So we just are not smart enough to understand how uh, these uh, medications might inhibit 
the long-term risk of kids in this age group. So uh, one of the risks that we find uh, here that's not even related to sterols or steroids is the potential effect statins may have on germ cell migration. This is an interesting study of zebra uh, fish where in one group of fish the uh, embryos were bathed in saline and in the other group they were bathed in Lipitor or atorvastatin. And if you look at picture A we can see that those bathed in saline had normal germ cell migration where the germ cells clumped and that's what we want. We want the germ cells to clump. Uh, but in the picture B we can see where the germ cells migrate chaotically and this is what we don't want particularly in a developing embryo where that can cause uh, birth defects, particularly in the tail of the uh, zebra fish. Now, I'm not an expert in zebra anatomy, but evidently in, in photo D here, this shows a defect in the development of this fish. And G and H show the chaotic migration of the germ cells when that embryo is bathed in the statin drug. Graph F shows that at higher concentrations of atorvastatin, the germ cell uh, migration becomes more and more chaotic. So it doesn't take me long to remember when I used to prescribe a drug called FenFen for weight loss and you know I thought this was the wonder drug. It, it caused, uh, it helped with weight loss, it increased libido, my little town in Driggs was was thin and procreating, my OB practice was was hopping uh, but I'll never forget the mother of three who came in in florid pulmonary edema uh, and echocardiogram showed cardiomyopathy with valvular uh, disease and I diagnosed her with idiopathic cardiomyopathy but it wasn't long until I realized that it wasn't idiopathic at all it was the drugs I was giving her that caused her heart to fail and uh, that really made me pause in regards to uh, the importance of having good evidence for safety and not just good evidence for harm. So the precautionary principle is one that I think we should all live by. It states that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking the action. Taking the action is us. Uh, when we prescribe some of these uh, chemicals that we just do not have good evidence for long-term safety. So the principle uh, implies that there's a social responsibility to protect the public from exposure to harm when scientific investigation has found a plausible risk. These protections can be relaxed only if further scientific findings emerge that provide sound evidence that no harm will result. So bottom line is if there is not good evidence for safety we should be precautionary and not expose our environment or our children to these chemicals. Heart attack is uh, God's revenge for eating his animal friends. Now, I'm not against a good steak once in a while, but we do know that in nutrition significantly trumps the effect of the statin. And the nutrition also goes beyond the heart. It also reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease, of cancer, of diabetes. So when we ask what therapy we should start when we have a child with dyslipidemia, I think we should put uh, the statins in our back pocket and first educate the family on the potential long-term benefits of nutrition, which has very little potential for harm. So Sir William Osler said it's physician's duty to educate the patient not to take medicine. And when we're talking about potentially exposing a prepubertal boy or girl to a drug that has uh, downstream effects that we just are not smart enough to know the potential risks of, we should practice a precautionary principle and send them to the nutritionist.